In this presentation, we will take a look at the book of Mosiah, chapters 7 through 10. This is where we start to see some of the flashbacks of different groups that Mormon, as he is bridging the plates, is going to give us as Zenith goes back to the land of Nephi, Lehi, and then as they become in bondage to the Nephites, or I'm sorry, the Lamanites, and as they try to escape and go back to the land of Zarahemla, Alma's people escaping, and then you have Limhi's people, and so this is the beginning where we start seeing some of the, the flashbacks and what happens to some of the people. So let's begin with Mosiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 25. Although the story recited in these verses is integral to the narrative of the Book of Mormon, it contains little of doctrinal importance. Two matters, however, are worthy of note. First, the people who left Zarahemla and returned to the land of Nephi-Lehi continued the system of temple worship that has always been central to the gospel plan. See verse 17. Contrary to many traditional Bible commentaries which hold that ancient Israel had only one temple and that in Jerusalem, we find indications in the Book of Mormon that the scattered remnants of Israel may all have maintained the same system of worship known in Palestine, including the use of temples. After arriving in the New World, the Lehite colony commenced the building of temples as soon as their situation allowed it. This temple was abandoned when Mosiah, the grandfather of the present Mosiah, led his people into the land to the north, the land of Zarahemla. Here they, they again built a temple, making it once more a focal point of their system of worship. In the record of when Ammon and his companions located those who had left Zarahemla, I'm s sorry that spelled wrong, to return to the land of Nephi-Lehi, again we find the temple as the center of the religious system. Whether this was the original Nephite temple or a new temple that had been built, we are not told. In either case, temples are at the heart of the worship among the pe Lord's people through the entirety of the Book of Mormon. A second doctrinal, a second doctrinal point, evident in what is otherwise simple storyline, is the reference to the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. They're walking through the Red Sea on dry ground, being fed manna from heaven, and so forth. This is a significant corroboration of the veracity of the Old Testament story of Exodus, also under assault by the scholarly world. It is presently popular to argue that Moses and his followers did not actually cross the Red Sea, that no real miracle of parting of the water of, was necessary. The Book of Mormon confirms that that's not true, that the true story is what is recorded there. They actually did cross the Red Sea. These verses also contain a synopsis of a call to faith given by King Limhi to his people in which to, he tells them to lift up their hearts, rejoice, and put their trust in God, their Father, a God of miracles. If their ancient fathers could be freed from bondage by the power of God, so could they. So, let's begin with Mosiah chapter 7. 7 verses 1 through 14 and then verses 8, 7 through 21, Nephite journeys. To understand the historical setting of, me, of Mosiah 7 through 8, you need to review the events contained in Omni 1, 27 through 30 and the chapter summaries from Mosiah 7, 8. These references discuss the leaders of the people in the land of Zarahemla as well as the kings in the land of Nephi, Lehi, Nephi, Zanoph, Noah, and Limhi. They also refer to the journeys of various groups of people between the city of Zarahemla and Zenoph's colony in the land of Lehi, Nephi. To, enter better, to better understand these travels, study the accompanying map. So here is a little map showing how... One, the ill-fated expedition that's in Omni 127. Number two, Zenith's expedition that's in Omni 121, 29, and then Mosiah 7, 9, and then 9, 3 through 7. 
Number three is Alma's escape to the waters of Mormon. Number four is the expedition of 43 men to find Zarahemla. That would be Ammon. That's in Mosiah 8, 8 through 9, and then 21, 25 through 27. And then number five is Ammon's expedition to find Zenith's colony, Mosiah 7, 2 through 3. And then line six is Limhi's escape to Zarahemla. That's in Mosiah 22, 3 through 13. And then line seven is Alma's people flee to Helam. That's in Mosiah 23, 1 through 5 and 19. And then line eight is Alma's escape to Zarahemla after being put in bondage in Helam by the wicked priest of Noah. And so that gives you the different journeys and coming back, leaving Zarahemla, and then those groups that went back. Uh, number four is also where the expedition of 43 men to find Zarahemla, they don't find it, but they do find a city that was destroyed that we later know as the Jaredite nation, and they find those 24 gold plates, which we know as the Book of Ether. So, Mosiah 7, 1. From them, from the time they left the land of Jerusalem, Zarahemla. See Omni 1, 27 through 30 for the account of Zenith leading some of the people of Zarahemla out of the land to seek the land of their fathers in Lehi-Nephi. Chapter 7, verse 3. A descendant of Zarahemla. See Omni 1, 12 through 19 for the account of Mosiah the first leading a righteous group of a righteous group out of the land of Lehi Nephi into the wilderness and eventually finding the people of Zarahemla. Chapter seven, verse seven, the phrase were committed to prison. Limni seems to have mistaken Ammon and his group for the wicked priests of Noah. See Mosiah 21, 23, and that's why he committed them to prison. Chapter 7, verse 13, the phrase to inquire concerning our brother whom Zenith brought up out of the land meant, see Mosiah 9, Zenith leads a group from Zarahemla to possess the land of Lehi-Nephi. The Lamanite king permits them to inherit the land. There is a war between Le Lamanites and Zenith's people about 200 to 187 B.C. Chapter 7, verse 14, the phrase, My brethren are yet alive. See Mosiah 21, 25 through 26, where Lemhi sends a group of men to look for the land of Zarahemla, but instead find a place full of bones that was once a mighty nation. Chapter 7, verse 18, the phrase, The time is at hand, refers to, The time had come for the Nephites in Lehi-Nephi to be brought out of bondage to to the Lamanites. The fulfillment of this prophecy is recorded in Mosiah chapter 22. Chapter 7 verse 19, the phrase the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who brought the children out of Israel uh, children of Israel out of Egypt meant this is Jehovah who is Jesus Christ. As noted earlier, the Book of Mormon is a sacred witness of the events of the Bible where the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, part of the Red Sea, and brought over on dry ground and were fed manna in the wilderness. Chapter 7, verse 20, the phrase, It is because of our iniquities and abominations that he has brought us into bondage, refers to, Wickedness never was happiness, Alma tells us in 41.10. Iniquity will always result in bondage and captivity, thus leading to a loss of freedom and agency, while keeping the commandments of the Lord will always lead to more freedom and agency. The commandments are liberating, not restrictive. What greater bondage today can be there be than that of addiction? Brothers and sisters, Satan, in his sophistry and flattery, tries to give us, convince us that keeping the commandments restricts our agency, where we learn that that is just the opposite. We gain more agency the more we become like Christ and keep his commandments. 
Chapter 7, verse 21, the phrase he, referring to Zenoph, being overzealous. Mosiah 9, 3 says, And yet I, Zenoph, being overzealous to inherit the land of our fathers, collected as many as were desirous to go up to possess the land, and started again on our journey into the wilderness to go up to the land. But we were smitten with famine and were sore afflicted, for we were slow to remember the Lord our God. Afflictions, some of the afflictions and infirmities that we have down here of our own making because we're slow to remember the Lord is our God and keep his commandments. Some afflictions come because that's just mortality. We will have afflictions and sufferings. Other things come because the Lord seeth fit to inflict certain things upon us to teach us through our sufferings. And then as we learn here, other afflictions come because of our own making because we're slow to remember the Lord our God. Chapter 7, verse 23 through 25, the phrase, Now behold, how great reason we have to mourn, refers to the fruits of wickedness and iniquity of not heeding the words of the Lord produces mourning, sorrow, and despair. Chapter 7, verse 26, a prophet of the Lord they have slain, referred to. The prophet referred to here is Abinadi, a great Nephi prophet whom the Lord raised up to declare repentance among the wicked people of King Noah. He was burned to death in the city of Nephi about 150 B.C. So you can see in chapter 7, Limhi is referring back to past things in his past. So when Zenith came and then his son, wicked King Noah, and then Limhi reigned. And during the time of wicked King Noah is when Abinadi came. And so Limhi is referring back to these stories that we will yet see the flashbacks and read about them later on. Chapter 7, verses 27 through 29, as we read later, Abinadi bore a powerful testimony to King Noah and his people that God himself should come down among the children of men and take upon him the form of man and go forth in mighty power upon the face of the earth, being oppressed and afflicted. It was for the testimony and for the doctrine that the wicked King Noah ordered Abinadi killed. There are two matters of particular interest here. First, that Abinadi plainly taught, as does the entire Book of Mormon, that Christ was the God of the Old Testament. This dispels another modern heresy, one that occasionally finds its way into this church, the idea that there was one God of the Old Testament, a God of vengeance, another God of the New Testament, a God of love. Such an idea is entirely untrue and defies the very nature and definition of God. Christ is the God of or Redeemer of all mankind, whether he lived in Old Testament times, New Testament times, or in the dispensation of the fullness of times. If you will read and study carefully the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah, who is Jesus Christ, you will see that he is just as merciful and kind and loving and patient with the house of Israel as he is in the New Testament. The only problem is the house of Israel were a rebellious group. And because of their open rebellion against Jehovah, he had to inflict the laws of justice upon him. The consequences of sin is that justice may has to now come and judgments are pronounced upon the house of Israel. So it was their choosing for being destroyed and destructed because they would not listen to Jehovah. He is not glad and happy that he has to punish the house of Israel. The law of justice says that he must do so. And because of the unrighteous use of their agency, the house of Israel in the Old Testament has judgments afflicted upon them. That is God's righteous use of justice. That's what it means by his anger. His anger is not that he's losing control and that he's mad. It's that he must now inflict the righteous use of justice among the rebelliousness of the house of Israel. And thus we see their destruction from time to time. 
The phrase, the other matter of special interest here, is the power associated with truth and the terror it strikes in the kingdom of darkness. The very foundations of hell tremble when a 14-year-old boy goes into a grove to pray, or a humble prophet like Abinadi bears his simple testimony in the streets of the city of Nephi. How Jehovah, even Jesus Christ, is both a God of vengeance, full of wrath, and a God of mercy, full of loving kindness. Here is how he is both. Jehovah of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ of the New Testament, because many see the God of the Old Testament as a vengeful and full of wrath, and the Christ of the New Testament as a God of mercy, full of loving kindness, that there must have been a change in deity. This cannot be since God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is in our misunderstanding and ignorance of the meaning of God's wrath and God's anger where we make our mistake. When we think of wrath and anger in our terms, meaning a loss of control, revenge, vengeance, etc., which if applied to God would be dangerous indeed. God's wrath or anger is his righteous use of justice. Let me say that again. His righteous use of justice. In Doctrine and Covenants 19, 16-17, it tells us that either we repent or we must suffer as the Savior did. When we read this, we do not say, oh, that is a God of wrath. No, we understand that the law of justice says either we use the gift of repentance enabled by the atonement of the Savior and receive mercy, or we have to suffer according to the divine law. In the example of God's anger through the conflagration and destruction of man and city is not God being so angry that he just decides to destroy a city. No, Jehovah is only applying the righteous use of the law of justice, which we are all taught and agreed to before we came to earth. Since the people of the city used their anciently unwisely, causing God's mercy not to be taught and agreed to before we came to earth. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I read that twice. Since the people of the city used their agency unwisely, causing God's mercy not to be applied. Open rebellion brings death. See Mosiah 15.26. Thus Jehovah only gave them what they wanted due to their open rebellion. As Elder Maxwell was known for saying, make sure you want the consequences of what you want. Because of the people's unrighteous use of agency, they were telling Jehovah that they wanted the consequences of justice that come with open rebellion against him, which is death, spiritual and sometimes physical. Open rebellion against the Savior and his anointed prophets, seers, and revelators, and you will... Open, I, I'm sorry, openly rebel against the Savior and his anointed prophecies and revelators, and you will see how immediate death is, spiritual death. I know of no quicker way of losing the spirit than this. Mercy is not unconditional. Just because of the atonement, no matter how much many in society wish it were, mercy is only brought about upon the conditions of repentance. You do not repent, then you are deciding to have Jehovah punish you. Therefore, according to justice, the plan of redemption could not be brought about only on conditions of repentance, Alma is telling us, of men in this probationary state, yea, this preparatory state. For except it were for these conditions, mercy could not take effect except it should be destroy the works of justice. Now the works of justice could not be destroyed. If so, God would cease to be God. See Alma 42, 13. That's what we just quoted. Therefore, God does, God does not really punish us, get wrathful or angry, but only imposes the laws of justice and mercy based upon the conditions of how we use our agency. We have the agency to choose wickedness or righteousness, but that is far as it goes. We do not have the agency to choose how and what consequences will be applied to us. 
the city and people that were destroyed in Numbers 11, or at any other time in the scriptures, which are many, occurred because the people chose that instead of God's mercy, that is condition, conditional upon repentance. Thus Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament and New Testament, the Book of Mormon, and the Doctrine and Covenants, is not a harsh God or a God of wrath, as we define it, a vengeful God or a God of anger, but a very loving, merciful, and just God, whose justice is applied when we use our agency to choose wickedness. So I guess you could say that we are choosing justice to be applied to us or his mercy applied when we use our agency to repent. God's presence or character has not changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The unrighteous use of agency still lead, today leads to death, spiritual death. With death, we need to learn is far greater than any physical death that could come upon us, since all will eventually be resurrected. But not all will choose to be brought back into the presence of God, but will be separated from him for eternity, which is spiritual death. We tend to read about these immediate physical things that happen to those in the Old Testament and think, wow, if that happened today, we would change, pay attention, etc., not really. It happens many times in the Book of Mormon and the Old Testament, and the people as a whole still did not change. Spiritual death, which we see all around us today, is simply, I'm sorry, is just as immediate, but mankind has become so ignorant of it that they do not sense or see the seriousness of it in their lives. The world see physical things more important than the spiritual realities. Thus, Dying physically seems harsher in our eyes. Satan is so good at deception. Also, I know from my own experience, and I have learned from those in Scripture, that immediate cessation of strife in life comes as we pay more attention to our spiritual selves rather than to our physical, temporal self. No, God is not wrathful, full of anger and vengeance as we mortals view it. He lovingly and righteously applies justice when we ask him to by our use of agency and actions in choosing to repent. We will always get our desires. Thus be careful of what you desire. As Alma 29, 4 says, For I know that he granteth unto men according to their desire, whether it be unto death or unto life. I know that he allotteth unto men, decreeth unto them decrees which are unalterable, according to their wills, whether they be unto salvation or unto destruction. So, brothers and sisters, you and I decide whether God is a God of justice and brings down judgments upon us, or whether he is a God of mercy and shows mercy because we decide to repent. As the scriptures plainly teach, once a person, city or nation, becomes ripe in iniquity, then the righteous use of justice will be brought about, will bring about their destruction. Woe unto them, Nephi says in 28.16, that turn aside the just for a thing of naught, and vile against that which is good, and say that it is of no worth. For the day will come that the Lord God will speedily visit the inhabitants of the earth. In, and in that day that they are fully ripe in iniquity, they shall perish, because that's what they chose, not because God has lost his temper. And now, Ether 2.9 says, we can behold the decrees of God concerning this land, that is a land of promise, and whosoever, whatsoever nation shall possess it will serve God, or they will be swept off when the fullness of his wrath shall come upon them, and the fullness of his wrath cometh upon them when they are ripened in iniquity, again, because of their choosing. And Ether 9.20 says, And thus the Lord did pour out his blessings upon this land, which was choice above all the other lands. And he commanded that those who should possess the land should possess it unto the Lord, or they should be destroyed when they are fully ripe in iniquity. For upon such, the Lord saith, I will pour out the fullness of my wrath, or in other words, the fullness of my justice. Remember, mercy cannot rob justice. If we do not repent, then justice will apply 
the punishments of God upon those who disobey. Chapter 7, verse 29, the phrase, I will not succor my people in the day of their transgression. This means, according to Doctrine and Covenants 58, Who am I that made man, saith the Lord, that will hold him guiltless, that obeys not my commandments? Who am I, saith the Lord, that have promised and have not fulfilled? I command, and men obey not. I revoke, and they receive not their blessings. So that's why God cannot succor us in the day of our salvation, because we must then reap the rewards of justice and judgments of God upon the wicked. Chapter 7, verse 30, the phrase, If my people show, shall sow filthiness, they shall reap the chaff thereof in the whirlwind. Limhi is here teaching what Amma will later call the law of restoration, what we have also come to know as the law of the harvest. We will reap what we sow. Chapter 7, verse 31, the east wind, which bringeth immediate destruction, means this is an Old Testament cultural symbol. The people of the Bible recognize the existence of four prevailing winds as issuing, broadly speaking, from the four cardinal points, north, south, east, and west. This is inferred from the custom of using the expression four winds as equivalent to the four quarters of the earth. The character of the directional winds was so consistent, varying not in nature, but only in degree throughout the seasons, that they come to be viewed as messengers from God. The north wind is cold. The west wind coming from the Mediterranean Sea is moist. The south, warm. And the east, which crosses the sandy waste of the Arabian Desert before reaching Palestine, can be violent and destructive. It was called the wind of the wilderness. So that's why they refer to the east wind bringing destruction. Because when there was the east wind, it brought destruction because of crossing those sandy de Arabian desert and breezing, bringing desert storms. Chapter 7, verse 33, full purpose of heart. This is an equivalent phrase to have to one having an eye single to the glory of God, and connotes an undivided commitment to the gospel cause. This is in contrast to that which we call half-hearted. Verse 33, the phrase, according to his own will and pleasure, means all that comes from heaven comes in his Christ's own time, and in his Christ's own way, and according to his Christ's own will. It is not for mortal man to establish deadlines for the Lord. We must be patient in the Lord's timing. Chapter 8. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. The sins of the fathers are visited upon the heads of the children. Lim's high people were in bondage of their own making, one resulting from their fathers having rejected the words of Abinadi and put him to death. How appropriate that Ammon, who would act as their liberator first taught and testified to them of the same truths that were rejected were taught by Abinadi. Having seen the fulfillment of Abinadi's prophecy and come into bondage, Limhi's people were now sufficiently humble to accept those truths, truths which would free them from the spiritual bondage that is always associated with rejecting the Lord's servants and enable them to free themselves from the temporal bondage the Lamanites had imposed upon them. This, the situation in which Limhi and his people found themselves, is a type of representation of the predicament that the scattered remnants of Israel are in the world over. They too must first accept that message previously rejected by their fathers if they are to be liberated from the spiritual darkness that is theirs. Only then can they expect the Lord to free them from their temporal bondage and allow them to return to the house of Israel, his church, as Limhi's people would, to the land and people they left. Chapter 8, verses 17 through 12. The 24 gold plates that Limhi's people found are the book of Ether concerning the Jaredites. The records of the Jaredites will be a second witness to the verity that disobedience brings bondage and destruction. A knowledge of the past is a great map by which we can mark a safe course for future travel in the, into the future. The restoration of the past may well have a more powerful effect upon the hearts and minds of men than the revelation of the future.
Chapter 8, verse 13, the phrase, the things are called interpreters. President Joseph Finley Smith provided this historical view of the interpreters referred to in the Book of Mormon. Quote, King Mosiah possessed two stones which were fastened into the rim, then to the two rims of a bow, called by the Nephites interpreters, with which he translated the Jaredite record. And these were handed down from generation to generation for the purpose of interpreting languages. How Mosiah came into possession of the two stones, or Urim and Thummim, the record does not tell us, more than to say that it was a gift from God. Mosiah had this gift, or Urim and Thummim, before the people of Lemhi discovered the record of Ether. There may have been received when the large stones was brought to Mosiah with engravings upon it, which he interpreted by the gift and power of God, talked about in Omni 1. They may have been given to him or to some other prophet before his day, just as the brother Jared received them from the Lord. These are the same Urim and Thummim interpreters that Joseph Smith found with the gold plates hidden in the hill Cumorah. Brothers and sisters, Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God, aided by the Urim and Thummim. The seer stone looking into a hat and all of that nonsense is false and brought up by David Whitmer after he is apostatized from the church to try to dispute Joseph Smith. Remember, David Whitmer apostatizes from the truth. and He is the one that makes up the story of the seer stone and looking into a hat and translating the Book of Mormon. And probably more important, I do not care how Joseph translated the Book of Mormon. He never gave us any details. Never. He only said, I did it by the gift and power of God. And that's all we need to know. All as I know is that the gift and the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. How Joseph translated makes little difference to me. What makes a difference to me is the witness and revelation that the book is is true and is what Joseph Smith claimed it was, revelation from God. That the Urim and Thummim are two stones given to the brother Jared with those in the possession of Mosiah appears evident from the following statements in the Book of Mormon. The brother of Jared was commanded to seal up his writings of the vision when he had when Christ appeared to him so that they could not be read by his people. This vision was in a language which was confounded, for it was not to go forth until after the resurrection of Christ. The Urim and Thummim were sealed up so that they could not be used for the purpose of interpreting so they could not be used for the purpose of interpreting those sacred writings of this vision until such time as the Lord should grant to man to interpret them. When they were to be revealed, they were to be interpreted by the aid of the same Urim and Thummim. Joseph Smith received with the brass plates and the plates of the Book of Mormon the Urim and Thummim, which were hit up by Moroni to come forth in the last days as a means by which the ancient record might be translated, which Urim and Thummim were given to the brother of Jared. End of President Smith's quote. It would be awfully foolish and stupid of God to give a Urim and Thummim, and then Joseph just finds some rock that's a seer stone, and he can translate things. No, that is not true. The Urim and Thummim were prepared by God. The Hebrew words Urim and Thummim, both plural, may be associated with the words lights and perfections. The International Standard Bible encyclopedia. These Syriac devices are used in receiving revelation and in translating ancient scripture records, which have been written in tongues unknown to the translators. Thus, the content of such records can be manifest only as the Lord wills, and only through his appointed prophet and seer. Mosiah chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. The phrase, a seer is greater than a prophet, refers to. The word prophet is found in the Old Testament comes from the Hebrew word navi, the v verbal root of which means to bubble or spring forth. Used in the form of a noun, it means one in whom the message of God springs forth, or one to whom anything is secretly communicated. Navi is generally defined as a speaker or spokesman for God. 
And I know there's a B in this. That's not a misspelling. It's just in the Hebrew, this particular way, the B is pronounced as a V. So it's Navi. Defined as a speaker or spokesman for God and carries the idea of one who is called. A prophet then is one commissioned by God to make known his will. The spirit of the prof of prophecy is the spirit by which the knowledge of God must be communicated and is not confined to the foretelling of future events. Similarly, among the Book of Mormon peoples, a prophet was understood to be a man chosen of God to speak his words, and to whom God had given greater power and authority to act in his name. So you could be a prophet acting in the name of God and testifying of Christ without being a seer. In the earliest old of Old Testament times, a prophet was called a seer from the Hebrew ro'eh, meaning one who sees. Contextually, this carried the idea of seeing that which was hidden to others. The Hebrew hosin, meaning one who sees a vision, has also been translated as seer. In addition, hosin carries the meaning to tell, to declare, or make known. It is generally supposed that a prophet is one who prophesies, meaning one who foretells the future. In fact, one can be a prophet without doing so. The role of a prophet is to proclaim the word of God by the authority of the Holy Ghost. A more, specific, and more specifically, a prophet is one who has and declares the testimony of Jesus. See Revelation 19.10. A prophet's primary role is to be a foreteller rather than a foreteller. To call a man a prophet is to emphasize his role in declaring the word of God, a foreteller, whereas to call him a seer is to emphasize the manner in which that word was received. Thus, it is properly said that a seer is greater than a prophet because all seers are prophets, but not all prophets are seers. Among the special spiritual gifts granted, the seer is the ability to restore, interpret, and understand the past. In, doing, in so doing, the seer may, by the use of various interpreters, translate ancient records that have been written in languages that are otherwise indecipherable. That are, that are otherwise indecipherable. That is what Mosiah did in translating the record of the Nephites and what Joseph Smith did in translating the Book of Mormon. Ammon comments relative to a seer as translator couched in a conversation about ancient records were not intended to be a complete description of a seer's role. Enoch said, Behold the spirits that God had created, and he beheld also things which were not visible to the natural eye. And from thenceforth came the same abroad in the land, a seer hath the Lord God raised unto his people. A seer is a visionary is a visionary in the highest sense, one who can see afar off. A seer wrote John A. Woodsow, a, of, a, an apostle, quote, is one who sees with spiritual eyes. He perceives the meaning of that which seems obscure to others. Therefore, he is an interpreter and clarifier of eternal truths. He foresees the future from the past and the present. This he does by the power of the Lord operating through him directly, or indirectly with the aid of divine instruments such as the Urim and Thummim. In short, he is one who sees, who walks in the Lord's light with open eyes. End of quote. That's why it's so critical that we sustain our prophets and apostles of first presidency as prophet seers and revelators. They have the gift of seership to see into the future to warn us of things to come. President Howard W. Hunter explained the unique role of a seer and how a seer views things differently than others. Quote, a seer is one who sees. This does not mean that he sees through his natural eyes, but rather through spiritual eyes. The seeric gift is a supernatural endowment. End of quote. Chapter 8, verse 20, the phrase, for they will not seek wisdom, meant wisdom is associated with the glory of God, which is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. See Doctrine and Covenants 9336. Thus, intelligence or wisdom is the righteous application of light and truth in our lives, which the natural man will not seek, for he seeketh to follow after his own will and understanding. 
So when it says, for they will not seek wisdom, it means they would not righteously apply light and truth in their lives. Chapter 8, verse 20, the phrase, she should rule over them, refers to the antecedent of she in this sentence is wisdom. Joseph Smith's translation of this verse, verse as she should rule rather than it should rule is in harmony with the Semitic worldview. In Hebrew and other languages of the ancient Near East, wisdom is a feminine noun. Now let's go to Mosiah chapter 9. Introduction. Mosiah 9 through 24 recounts the history of a colony led by Zeno from the land of Zarahemla to the land of Lehi Nephi. The record covers a period of almost 80 years from about 200 BC until the return to Zarahem, the land of Zarahemla in about 121 BC. This was about the same time period that King Mosiah I, Benjamin, and Mosiah II were reigning in the land of Z Zarahemla. Zenith, Noah, and Limhi reigned in the land of Lehi, Nephi. During the reign of King Noah, the prophet of Benedi warned the people to repent. He also prophesied of pending destruction for, return, for turning from God. Abinadi's teachings also demonstrate the Savior's divinity, his unity with the Father, and the great sacrifice the Savior would make in the atonement process. By studying the words of Abinadi, you can renew feelings of gratitude for the Savior's sacrifice and gain a deeper appreciation of the atonement. Abinadi's martyrdom exhibits his great courage. Abinadi's testimony led to the conversion of Alma, but cost Abinadi his life. As you ponder the events of Benedi's ministry, consider the influence that one righteous man had on future generations. Through his one known convert, Alma, came the next several generations of prophets who prepared the people for the coming of Jesus Christ. Like Abinadi, we too can profoundly affect our family and others we know by testifying the truth and by living righteously. Insert before Mosiah 9. The insert heading prior to the chapter summary of Mosiah 9 is part of the original record given to Joseph, Prophet Joseph Smith. The phrase comprising chapters 9 through 22 exclusively was added when the Book of Mormon was published in chapter format in the 1879 edition. Mosiah 9. The record of Zenith, Mosiah 9, 1 through 4, and Omni 1, 27 to 29, both relate the story of Zenith, first exposition to recolonize the land of Nephi Lehi. However, Mosiah 9, 1 through 2 reveals why the first expedition fought the civil war and was forced to return to the land of Zarahemla. Zenith did not like the war, but desired to live in peace among the Lamanites. Mosiah 9 through 10 was written by Zenith without abridgment or comment by Mormon. Note that the date of Mosiah 8 is 121 BC. The date of Mosiah 9 is 200 BC. The record reverted back in time 80 years to tell what happened in the land of Nephi, Lehi Nephi during the time period of Benjamin and Mosiah's reign in Zarahemla. This is one of our first flashbacks. Mosiah 9 through 22. Those chapters are the history of Zenith and his people. The Book of Mormon is often confusing because of the different storylines and historical flashbacks that are part of the book. Refer to the chart flashbacks from Omni through Mosiah. That chart I put in later. Oh, no, actually, I, I, maybe I have that here in just a minute. The his history contained in Mosiah's chapter 9 through 22 flashes back approximately 80 years to the time when Zenith and a small band of followers left the land of Zarahemla to return to the land of Nephi. The record contains the history of King Zenith, Noah, and Lemhi. The flashback narrate, narrative takes the reader back to the Book of Mormon history as Zenith group is re reunited with the people of Zarahemla in Mosiah 25. So here's that flashback. You can see that King Mosiah and King Benjamin and then King Mosiah again reign. But during that time, you have Zenith's group down in the land of Nephi and his son with King Noah and Limhi and Abinadi. And then the break off of Alma 
as he leaves, as he repents and takes a group, and then how they all eventually make it back to the reign of Mosiah the second. So that's kind of the flashback we're starting to see now happen in Mosiah chapter 9. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 11, I, Zenith. We begin here a first-person account in Zenith's own words, an account inserted into the large plates by Mormon, which continues to the end of chapter 10. The pro propriety of a group of Nephites returning to inhabit the land of Neath, Lehi Nephi, whence their fathers had fled at the Lord's direction at the time of Mosiah 1 is questionable. There is no suggestion in the scripture text that the Lord approved of this venture. Indeed, so bad was the spirit among those in the first group attempting to recolonize the land that when Zena suggested that they make a treaty with the Lemlites rather than attack and kill them, an attempt was made to kill him. This divided the would-be colonizers into two warring factions and resulted in the death of the greater part of their number. Returning to Zarahemla, Zenith recruited another group to attempt his venture. These, we are told, were smitten with famine and sore affliction because they were slow to remember God, and that they and their families were to know little about bondage, and they and their families were to know little about were to know little but bondage, death, and difficulty until the time of their repentance and their return to the land of Zarahemla. Nothing in their experience suggests that their efforts had any claim to the kind of protection accorded the Lord's Peter people when their course is approved by him. So we have no record that Zenith was inspired by God to lead this group down. In fact, it tells us that Zenith is overzealous and he just wants to return for whatever reason we are not told to the land of Nephi. So this was probably not approved of the Lord and that's why Zenith is on his own. Zena, or chapter 9, verse 3, I, Zenith, being overzealous, meaning Zenith's overzealousness became his downfall, which led to him and those who followed him to the land of Nephi, Nephi, to become into bondage to the Lamanites. Elder Downey Choke gave a talk at BYU on how our strengths can become our downfall. He gives 20 examples of strengths that a person may have and how if we do not use balance and humility, the adversary can get us to focus too much on a strength at the expense of other doctrines and principles that the one strength becomes weakness that can cause our downfall. One example Elder Oaks gives is Satan's temptation to cause us to misapply our spiritual goal, spiritual gifts. Elder Oaks related, quote, The Revelations tells us that there are many gifts, and to every man is given a gift by the Spirit of God. All of these gifts come from God for the benefit of the children of God. Most of us have seen persons whom the adversary has led astray through a corruption of their spiritual gift. My mother shared one such example, something she observed while she was a student at BYU many years ago. A man who had lived in the community in Utah had a mighty gift of healing. People sought him out for blessings, many coming from outside his ward and state. In time, he made almost a profession of giving blessings. As part of his travels to various communities, he came to the apartments of BYU students asking if they wanted blessings. This man had lost sight of the revealed direction on spiritual gifts, always remembering for what they are given. A spiritual gift is given for the benefit of the children of God, not to magnify the prominence or gratify the ego of the person who received it. The professional healer who forgot that lesson gradually lost the companionship of the spirit and was eventually excommunicated from the church. So there's how a great strength he had, a spiritual gift, eventually led to his downfall because he became out of balance and used it unwisely. We need to be careful that we don't let our strengths become our downfall and that we use them unwisely, that we always have balance and harmony with all gospel principles and not just focus on one strength. Chapter 9, verses 12 through 15. Now they were a lazy and an idolatrous people, referred to. 
As virtue cleaves to virtue, so vice cleaves to vice. As honest toil is an invitation to the Spirit of the Lord, so idleness allures the spirit of the adversary. Idleness tends to breed thievery and plundering, which in turn bring the shedding of blood, fighting, and even wars. Such are the fruits of idolatrous worship, worship that requires neither humility nor righteousness, but rather satisfies some supposed whim or appetite, and thus justifies such rituals in living a satis, rituals in living a satiate a person's carnal appetite and desires. Living, a, living as satiate a person's, meaning you, you don't get a sat a a complete uh, fulfillment of your carnal apples and tires. You're always trying to satisfy them. This is referring to the to the Lamanites. Chapter 9, verses 17 through 18, and 10, verses 10 through 11 and 19, the phrase, in the strength of the Lord. Zenith recorded that they fought in the strength of the Lord when battling the Lamanites. Although Zenith's people were greatly outnumbered, they overcame their Lamanites' aggressors with comparatively few casualties. Their success was due to their faithfulness to God and not necessarily the amount or type of weapons they had. The Lord heard their cries and blessed them with strength. Throughout the Book of Mormon, we see that giving, giving strength to his people is one of God's tender mercies. Benjamin's people in Zarahemla were victorious over the Lamanites because they fought in the strength of the Lord. There is probably application to this. We will only win our battle with Satan if we fight in the strength of the Lord. And that will only come in... in in comparison to our um, worthiness to have the strength of the Lord. In the book of Alma, the success of the Nephite armies can be attributed to their ability to trust in God to assist them in their battles, and not in the size of the army. Although our battles may not be physical warfare, the faith and the strength of the Lord teaches us to, that we too can ask for assistance from God to grant us strength to triumph over our foes. And there are many in this wicked world. Isaiah chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 1, the phrase to establish the kingdom. This is not a reference to the kingdom of God, but rather to the community being reestablished in the land of Lehi Nephi by Zenith. The phrase, I call that there should be weapons of war made of every kind, meant we too need weapons of every kind to withstand the enemy. Satan. Elder Marky Peterson told us what Satan's greatest weapon is. He said, seduction. Quote, seduction is his greatest weapon. Do we realize that? I repeat, seduction is the greatest weapon of the devil. It is alluring. It falsely appears to be advantageous and desirable. He would have us think that bitter is sweet, that black is white, that sin is acceptable, that virtue is obsolete, archaic, and prudish. Because he, reveal, he revels in filth, he would tell us that to be clean is in some naive concept of our grandmother's age, what does not apply in this enlightened day. He says that evil is good and that standards have been relaxed. Go your way, he says. Fear no consequences. Do your own thing. Have fun. Express your basest desires if you wish and let yourselves go. That is his philosophy. Do we recognize it when it is flung at us by our angry foes or when it comes with a soft voice and a disarming smile? Do we truly recognize evil when we see it? Do we really know right from wrong? If we do not, then let us hasten to learn from our church leaders. They will tell us quickly and plainly. End of quote. Chapter 10, verse 3, Inherit the Land. We should be more inclined to say that they possessed the land rather than inherited it. There is a spiritual connotation associated with the people inheriting the land that is missing here. Chapter 10, verse 5, clothe our nakedness. Zenith's people clothed themselves by their own industry. Laman's people who were indolent and idle ran naked. This suggests that industry and modesty are natural companions, while idleness and immodesty are often found sharing 
are often found sharing companions. Mosiah chapter 10 verses 12 through 17, false traditions. The Lamanites came to accept as truth a distorted version of events concerning the original journey from Jerusalem. These false traditions were handed down from generation to generation, creating deep prejudice or an eternal hatred among the Lamanites against the Nephites. In Latter-day Revelation, the Lord warned that Satan used false traditions to take away light and truth. Because of these traditions, Lamanites felt justified in murdering, robbing, and attempting to destroy or enslave the Nephites. Thus, the Lamanites came under the fight, false ideology of victimhood, which belief brings people into captivity and bondage to their own false belief systems and wallow in being a victim. Therefore, they feel they are owed something from society or a specific group of people instead of relying upon light and truth of God to progress and overcome any perceived injustices. Maybe Mormon includes these stories because he knew in our day we would have this false ideology of victimhood where people would say they're oppressed and they're victims and they are owed something and therefore they are justified in their anger and hatred of other groups of people because of their victimhood. This is only Satan's philosophy, this victimhood ideology and being oppressed by oppressors. Do not fall for this false ideology. The Book of Mormon warned us it would happen. The Lamanites claim to be victims because of false traditions, false ideologies. And that is happening today. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles that we should, that we should, what we should do when a family or cultural tradition conflicts with God's plans or standards. He counseled us to carefully examine our lives to determine what traditions may differ from the may differ from the teachings of the Lord. Quote, Your Heavenly Father assigned you to be born to a specific lineage from which you received your inheritance of race, culture, and traditions. That lineage can provide a rich heritage and great reasons to rejoice. Yet you have the responsibility to determine if there is any part of that heritage that must be discarded because it works against the Lord's plan of happiness. You may ask how you may ask how can one determine when a tradition is in conflict with the teachings of the Lord and should be abandoned. That is not easily done. I have found how difficult it is as I work to overcome some of my own incorrect traditions. Customs and traditions become an inherent part of us. They are not easy to evaluate objectively. Carefully study the scriptures and counsel of the prophets to understand how the Lord wants you to live. Then evaluate each part of your life and make any adjustments needed. Seek help from, uh, from, another, from another you respect who have been able to set aside some deeply held convictions or traditions that are not in harmony with the Lord's plan. It's yours. A, is yours a culture where the husband exerts a domineering, authoritative role, making all of the important decisions for the family? That pattern needs to be tempered so that both husband and wife act as equal partners, making decisions in unity for themselves and their family. Those, that These are other traditions that should be set aside. Any aspect of heritage that would violate the word of wisdom that is based on forcing others to comply by the power of station, often determined by hereditary, that encourages the establishment of caste systems, that breeds conflict with other cultures. Those are things that, if that is part of our heritage, we need to get rid of in our lives. End of the quote. Chapter 10, verse 13, Nephi was favored of the Lord. Behold, the Lord esteemeth all flesh as one. He that is righteous is favored of God, and he loveth those whom he will have him to be their God. Behold, he loved our fathers, and he covenanted with them, yea, even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he remembered the covenant which he hath made unto them. Yes, God has favors, but notice how it's done. He favors all who want to be righteous. So you can become favored. He's not picking and choosing. We are choosing whether we are favored of the Lord. 
of Hiram Smith, a man of like spirit to the prophets of old, the Lord said, I, the Lord, loved him because of the integrity of his heart and because he loveth that which is right before me. All who choose to live as such men have lived will receive the same favor of the Lord. Whereas, if you keep my commandments, Christ said, the love of the Father shall not continue with you. I'm sorry, if you keep not my commandments, Christ said, the love of the Father shall not continue with you. Therefore, you shall walk in darkness. So it is us who is choosing to be favored of the Lord. And that depends on how we walk and whose commandments we keep. Chapter 10, verse 14, the phrase, understood not the dealings of the Lord. Laman and Lamiel murmured against their father and their younger brother because they knew not the dealings of God who had created them. Indeed, they would never know the dealings of the Lord because they would not as so much as inquire of the Lord. They wouldn't even inquire of him. If no seed has been planted, one can hardly expect a rich an abundant harvest. No wonder they got caught in the trap of victimhood mentality that kept them and their descendants in bondage to a false ideology. Chapter 10, verse 15, the phrase, they sought to kill him. The spirit of murder which actuated Laman and Lamiel affirms clearly the master in whose employ they were. Thus they abs they abs their, I mean, that should be, thus, their obsession of victimhood seeks to destroy others for one's own failings instead of focusing on light and truth to overcome false traditions or false beliefs. That's the danger of this victimhood, is we seek to blame others for the way we are instead of seeking to improve ourselves and overcoming our own weaknesses. Chapter 10, verse 17, the phrase, have taught hate. Heaven's truth stand in the light of day. They teach love, patience, long-suffering, forgiveness. False traditions feed on hatred and bitterness, which among many people have been passed from generation to generation. Hatred is a bitter seed that can produce nothing but bitter fruit, such as prejudice and racism. That is at the heart of this ideology of victimhood, is that it produces hatred hate of other cultures and other races. It causes racism. Whites can be racist. Blacks can be racist. Asian can be racist. All can be racist if we have hatred in our heart for others. Victimhood does not counsel out racism and justify you in racist actions. Chapter 10, verses 20 through 22. The purity of intent of Zenith and his people is evident by their actions after war, a quiet return to the tending of their flocks, tilling of their ground, and raising their families. We do not read of rejoicing over military victories, over spoils gained in war, or of continued hostilities towards the enemy. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helps you and we continue with the large plates of Nephi and some of these flashbacks that we will see. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button. 